drought. Nothing personal word of the day. It is Friday, April 1st, 2022. And on behalf of Matthew Coca, we would like to welcome you to the month of April and tell you thank you for a record month of March. We will make April a record because we're here with you every day. Today is April Fool's Day, but nothing personal is going to rename it. We don't want this to be April Fool's Day because 568 episodes into nothing personal, not counting the mailbags and the sit downs, etc., the emergency pods. You should realize, as we do, that every day is April Fool's Day. Everybody in their statements, everybody during the course of running their business, in their lives, in their social lives. Yes, I'm talking about you, Jerry. Everybody's lying all the time. Everybody's fooling. I think that we should rename April 1st as Don't Be a Fool Day. So that is what we are going to suggest. I am calling my local Congress people because they have plenty of time. They're doing a bunch of investigations. They're having committees. They have meetings. They meet with lobbyists. They do all sorts of things. They're trying to confirm a Supreme Court justice. I love the fact that you can say that you vote for someone to become a circuit judge and then a year later, you're not going to vote for them to be a Supreme Court justice. I like that. I'm talking about you, Lindsey Graham. Yes, I am. What exactly changed, Lindsey? How about April 1st? You're the fool day. Maybe we do that. No, I like it. Don't be a fool day. The word of the day is drought. Drought is always associated for the people who don't engage with sports and care about sports. Drought is something that has to do with food, right? We're in a drought. No rain. We're having some sort of drought. It can have to do with sex. I'm in a drought. There's all sorts of things it can do with. It means is I have not been able to get that which I normally get and that I want to get again. It's drought. Brian Cashman is the general manager, president of baseball operations. Maybe he's just the general manager. The Yankees may not have named him president of baseball operations, or maybe they did. Who cares? He's been with the Yankees for a long time. Hall of Fame, unbelievably successful, but has not been to or won a World Series since 2009. And Yankees fans seem to believe that that is a significant drought. And for the Yankees, I would agree it is. They went a decade, the 2010s, without being in a World Series. It was like their first decade, you know, since Chuck Berry wrote Johnny B. Good, or even before that. And people were critical of Brian Cashman and Hal Steinbrenner, and it made us crazy. Even when we were in the game, we would laugh at people saying the Yankees are in a drought. Yankees don't spend money. Hal Steinbrenner's cheap. Hal Steinbrenner doesn't want to go over the luxury tax threshold, doesn't want to pay the competitive balance tax, blah, blah, blah. When you are competing with the Yankees, you view them as a juggernaut because they always spend money every year. It may not always work out. We've told you what it takes to actually get through October. The Yankees, for whatever reason, have never believed that pitching is required. They always want to recreate the Bronx Bombers. Garrett Cole plus four rainouts is not going to get you a World Series ring. I get it. But apparently Brian Cashman, who's in the last year of his contract, is getting a little testy. He did an interview yesterday where he complained that people mischaracterized the Yankees' drought. He said, I don't like people saying that we haven't been to the World Series since 2009. Well, I don't know why you don't like it because that just as a fact. As a matter of fact, that is perfect for April 1st, the new holiday, don't be a fool day, where we're all going to tell the truth. Brian Cashman said the only thing that stopped us was something that was so illegal and horrific. So I get offended when I start hearing we haven't been to the World Series since 2009, because I'm like, well, I think we actually did it the right way. Pulled it down, brought it back up, drafted well, traded well, developed well, signed well. Hmm. Hello, freezing cold takes. You sure they drafted well? Traded well? Developed well? There is no team. Spoiler alert. If you hear a president or owner or GM tell you that their team drafts well and trades well and develops well and signs well, they're trying to get you to forget about all of the drafts, the trades, the developments, and the signings that didn't go well. 
because there are many, and the Yankees have as many as the Dodgers, as the Marlins, as the Brewers. Everybody's got them. The only thing that derailed us, Cashman continued, was a cheating circumstance that threw us off. Of course, Brian Cashman is referring to the 2017 American League Championship Series when in the semifinals, which is the semifinals of the baseball postseason tournament, they lost to the Houston Astros, and that was the year of the garbage can. That was the year of Garrett Cole. I wonder if Brian Cashman says to Garrett Cole, hey, you're the reason why we're in a drought, so get us out of it. So Brian Cashman is looking back on that time, and it got me thinking. When you run a team or when you're a fan of a team or when you run a business or when you have a social life or when you live your life, however it is that you live it, how many times during the course of a day do you do the if statement? The if statement is a statement that helps us all get through the day because it explains our failures. It explains our misfortunes. If it only had been for blank, if it only hadn't happened in that way, then I wouldn't have blanked. Just fill in your own blank. I want you to count like this weekend. How many times you think it. It doesn't have to be that you say it to other people because saying it to yourself is just as bad. But people say it to other people during the course of a conversation. You're sitting at a bar and you want to talk to someone who's on the other side of the bar and then you don't get a chance to and you walk out of the bar and you say, if only that guy hadn't walked up to her, I would have approached. If only I hadn't had that last drink, I wouldn't have gotten sick. If only Starks had hit one more shot, the Knicks would have won a title. I like that. That's the human condition. Because it's really hard when you sit through the course of a life and you don't have the if statement. Because then you have to look at yourself and say, uh-oh, the thing that happened to me is because of me. The reason I didn't get what I wanted or accomplish the goal that I set I couldn't work out today, it was raining. Couldn't get to work on time. Just another manic Monday. I blamed it on the train. Damn, the boss is already there. It's an excuse world, isn't it? And so I started to dig deeper as I was thinking about the show into excuses that people make and the reason for excuses. And I realized it's a defense mechanism against mediocrity. Because who wants to be mediocre? You hear about people all the time who are trying to bring you down and they say, I, I think about this too when people say things about me and they just want, they're not trying to get to my level, they're trying to bring me down to their level because then the frame of reference becomes easier to stomach. If you can't be an achiever, then you don't want to be gauged against achievers. If you can't be in shape, you don't want to be compared to those who are. If you can't be successful in your company, then you want the person next to you to fail as you do. It's an old, it's an old thought. They call it schadenfreude, which is happiness at the misfortune of others. That's only part of it, right? The other part is how people engage themselves. And so on Nothing Personal, we talk about self-awareness. We talk about delusion and how when you're in the sports business, we are so full of that quality where we don't have a lot of self-awareness. We think the world revolves around us. We are always full of excuses because we don't want to be judged because in sports, there aren't a lot of businesses like it where at the end of the day, 162 nights a year, there's no judgment required because you've got a black and white result. Sports is, is math and that's why I love it. You win or you lose. And you can meet the media after a game and you can talk about the bad call by the referee or the umpire. You can talk about how you got totally screwed by not having the right penalty call or you didn't get a foul called or you didn't hit the shot or Charles Smith didn't go up strong in the playoffs. You can come up with a plethora of excuses but what if people just looked in the mirror and said, we just got beat? Once in a while, you'll hear a manager say, they're just a better team. But they couch it by saying, today they were a better team. Today we got beaten by a better team. 
Brian Cashman has to face a season right now where they're in the American League East. And the problem with the American League East is that Toronto's a better team. The Rays are a better team. There is a world in which the Red Sox are a better team. That leaves the Yankees maybe in fourth place. Yet there's three wild cards, and everyone is projecting that the AL East could give you three wild cards plus a division winner. There could be some teams in the AL West who will have something to say about that. But the reality is that when you are facing a season where the expectation for your team is always World Series or bust, and you know as a good baseball person, wow, we're just not as good as these two other teams. And you know that the narrative about your team is going to be negative. You try to get ahead of it. So Brian Cashman's version of trying to get ahead of it didn't work. It didn't land. It was like the routine. Wait, did the guy in old school land when they had to do the the vault? That big heavy set guy who had to do the vault in front of Jeremy Piven, who was the dean of the school? I think he did land it. So it wasn't that. Why is that in my head? I have no idea. We didn't even talk about old school in preparing for the show. So Brian Cashman attempting to explain what could be coming in the next six months, tried to start you with, hey, don't say the drought is since 2009 because we actually made the World Series in 2017. I guess that's true. Thank you, Brian. Okay, did you, oh God, I love you, Danny. Oh yes, I do. I love you, Snyder, because you are true. Daniel Snyder, he's meant for nothing personal. Did you see what went on yesterday? Well, I'm going to go through it with you. We've seen a lot about Snyder. Forget the fact that he likes calendars with his cheerleaders naked or in compromising positions. Forget the fact that the team has more front office dysfunction than any front office I've ever seen, and that's coming from a front office that had dysfunction. We're talking about a team that is fighting with partners. I'm aware of that. A team that's involved in a lawsuit was involved in a lawsuit with partners. I'm aware of that. Everything that Daniel Snyder is going through as an owner, I was aware of and a part of as a president of a team. But yesterday, something came out that I never did. The San Diego Padres didn't even do this. They only did it with medical records. But there is a rumor and a possibility, but I like it when the article says, according to sources sources who have to remain anonymous because of the sensitive nature of the investigation. I don't care why sources need to remain anonymous, but everybody feels they need to give a reason. Sources close to the situation, though not allowed to speak. Sources inside the room, but sworn to secrecy. If you're a source, by definition, there's a reason why you're not putting your name to it, whether it's you're just scared to put your name to it, or you literally can't put your name to it, or whether it's some sort of national security or some sort of sports major story that could happen. But we don't have to say why a source is a source. It's just a waste of my eyes reading it. I don't care. A source is just someone whose name is not there. Okay. I'm going to get past that. But a source came out yesterday, anonymously. (laughs) Wait, I just realized, what source is not anonymous? That seems redundant, doesn't it? A source. (laughs) Sorry, it's Friday. I'm tired. Yesterday was quite a day. Hey, you may want to check out Back on the Record with Bob Costas tonight at 11 o'clock Eastern. Or you may not. Tape that yesterday with J.J. Reddick, who has a great podcast, Old Man and the Three, Candace Buckner, who is a wonderful writer for the Washington Post, Detour here, Coca, and Bomani Jones. Bob Costas led the roundtable. And I, uh, I don't often get starstruck because I'm lucky in my life that I've been in the right place at the right time, especially when you start on third. And I got to meet a lot of celebrities. Just when you run a team, you meet celebrities. They all want free tickets. And I've told you that I got to choose who got the free tickets, who didn't. And I would choose who I would go say hello to, who I would greet, who I wouldn't. Billy Crystal, for those of you who know me and know my movie taste, from City Slickers to Princess Bride to When Harry Met Sally, which is the romantic movie of my life. Next time you're at Katz's Deli, take a look on the wall. You may see a familiar face. 
Yes, I am on the wall of Katz's Deli. That's a f total flex, by the way. I'm sorry, but that's as close as I'm going to get to stardom is being on the wall of Katz's. So I get to the studio yesterday, and they bring me right to my dressing room. I don't know why I need a dressing room, but it, it had a TV, and it had a couch, and it had a door that I kept open. And it was J.J. Redick, then David Sampson, and then Billy Crystal, just right in a row. So I'm standing in the hallway because I want to see Billy Crystal, who I hadn't seen since the World Series in 03. He's a huge Yankee fan. And I learned on the show that Billy Crystal, the story that he told in City Slickers about his best day, watch the show tonight, but spoiler alert, his best day in City Slickers was actually his best day in Billy Crystal's life which is sort of cool. And so I talked to Billy Crystal. It turns out that he's got a relative who may be going to Wisconsin. I went to Wisconsin, so we had a conversation. He's still upset about the 03 Marlins beating his Yankees, but we had a fun time. And I wanted to take up, have you ever had this position where you want to take, say, can I get a picture? And I just didn't do it. And I didn't do it because of this weird feeling that I had which is I don't want to be that guy. But yet, in my whole career, I've watched players go up to other players, even their own teammates. I watch players go up to each row and say, can I have a picture? Can I get a signed jersey? Players go to players on the other side. Team, not their teammates, someone who plays for a different team. Hey, I'd love to get a jersey or a ball or a picture. The back and forth in clubhouses would shock you. In basketball, Dwayne Wade is exchanging jerseys with people his last year. What would have been wrong with it? Nothing. But I totally geeked out and I wanted to have this aura of gravitas like I belong here so I'm not going to be the one who asks for a photo because I'm David Sampson and I'm important, blah, blah, blah. Give me a break. I should have just said, by the way, I'm totally geeking out right now and I just wanted you to know. And he would forget about it 10 seconds later because people say that to him 50 times a day at minimum those who can get close enough to say it. And how am I gonna get closer than being on a stage with him and being next to him in a dressing room and getting makeup put on together? I mean, come on. So the show is on tonight. We sat there and taped it. So it'll be edited because it has to be edited for time. It should be interesting, so tune in. How did I even get to that detour, Coke? I have no idea. But we're talking about the Washington Commanders and Daniel Snyder, and the fact that he is a content machine. Oh, we were talking about two sets, but that has nothing to do with my story about HBO. We we're talking about two sets of medical records, which the San Diego Padres had after their trade of, um, oh my God. Who did they trade to us who was hurt and we sent him back and then traded Luis Castillo for Dan Strelly? his name and he, he's not pitching anymore because he did end up having Tommy John surgery and then he came back and he wasn't good. I'm um, Chris Colin Ray. Whew. Keep the Fridays are tough, right? The file cabinet's going at all time, right? The Rolodex in my brain. And then Friday after the show, I just sort of collapse. I, I start drinking tea, put in some cough drops and it's Friday. So Daniel Snyder has been investigated, as you know, a Congress, Congress opened an investigation into their workplace harassment. We've talked about that. We've talked about that the reason they're doing that is they want to set an example of this NFL team so that other businesses around the country try to not have this toxic environment. That's the theory under which they're doing an investigation, though critics of the investigation are correctly saying, wow, this seems like a waste of time. Proponents of the investigation are correctly saying, no, no, we're trying to make an example of the commanders. They're both correct, which makes it difficult. So therefore, you might as well just keep going down your track. And so they are. But the thing is, when you're under investigation by Congress, what happens is they have the ability to subpoena emails or documents or depositions. They've got subpoena authority. And when you hand over documents, you've got to hand over responsive documents. And there's an argument going on right now between what's responsive, what's privileged, and what's not. Privilege is when you have had communication with your lawyer. That's why when you text with your lawyer or email with your lawyer, you put on the top privileged JIC in case there's ever a lawsuit. So all of a sudden a rumor 
an anonymous rumor has been spreading that the Washington commanders may have kept two sets of books, not medical records, financials. And my mind exploded. So I'm familiar with 30 baseball teams, been around sports the majority of my career. I've seen a lot of things. I've seen a lot of people with a lot of ego. I've seen people get elected who are definitely um, questionable with their accountants and what they do. So people with two sets of books, no doubt. I've seen it. I've seen very wealthy people who take liberties with their taxes, with their write-offs, how they value assets. I've seen banks evaluate net worth statements and not scrub them the way they should prior to giving loans. I've seen all sorts of people who just look for confirmation of what they want to do and just need a check the box. Excuse me. Bless me. Why do you get blessed when you sneeze? Like, why is that the time when God blesses you? What's the story there, Coca? Is God somehow manifesting him or herself through a sneeze? And so you've been blessed? Or when you sneeze, is that the devil inside you, which is so that God has to bless you so that you can be healthy again and not be overtaken by evil spirits? To me, it's when I've got lint in my nose, but maybe I'm just not fully evolved. So I've seen what people do in order to borrow money. And Daniel Snyder had to borrow a tremendous amount of money in order to buy out his partners. And he bought out his partners for about $875 million. His team is valued at around three or four billion. He bought it for 800 million back in 1999, which at the time people said he was crazy and now look what it's worth. By the way, totally run it into the ground and still had an increase in asset value. So maybe we're the fools, not Danny. But Danny had to borrow money in order to buy out these partners because there was a lawsuit. Remember, that's the whole Fred Smith, the guy from Castaway who welcomed back Tom Hanks. So he's a minority partner, limited partner in the Redskins. And he pressured the Redskins to change their name. He threatened to remove FedEx as a sponsor. So it's been a major issue between Danny Boy and his partners. So during the course of that disagreement, apparently it was resolved by him going to a bank, borrowing a bunch of money, and there is a thought that he may have overstated his net worth, may have understated the value of the Redskins, because in the real world, it's not what Forbes says. When you are appraising a team, you are looking, especially when it's just a partner within a partner, a GP buying out LPs, you are looking at the actual business of the team. What if Daniel Snyder had his accountants or his CFO or his finance department? I mean, listen, if he has his in-game entertainment department cut a video of his cheerleaders, it's not that far-fetched that he would have his accounting department come up with a set of books that would show a level of health of his team that may not be accurate. Sort of like based on a true story. When you watch a movie and it says that, based on a true story, we all say, oh, I guess everything in that, ha- in that story is true. And then the credits roll and there's always a proviso. Some events have been dramatized. Some characters have been created because it's a movie and we need to be entertained. It needs to flow. It's why winning time on HBO, everything about it is not true. It's based on a true story. JFK, all these different things, all these movies, all these stories, even 127 hours, right? Now, he definitely cut his arm off. So that part was true. I don't know why that movie is in my head right now. I have the the song from 127 Hours, the music that's playing at the end. I'm going to get emotional about that, believe it or not, because it is so inspirational when he frees himself, he cuts his arm off, and then he 
finds help because he gets out of the canyon where he is and he finds people and they're playing this music and I downloaded the song and it's like an 11 minute song and it's got it's instrumental and uh it is a great song to run to because it covers like over a mile and so you know when it comes on you say all right I get to enjoy this I'm going to be a mile further done with my run why was that in my head Coca, please get me. I can't get back. This is it. We're going to need to do a wipe. Wipe it. Wipe it. Wipe it. All right. Commanders, 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 commanders. Two sets of books. Oh! So if Daniel Snyder is trying to convince his partners of something that's not true in order to get a lower valuation, is that a crime? When you do a deal with someone when they are buying shares, when you are buying shares, there's a contract. In that contract, there are representations and warranties. A representation and warranty is when you are telling the other side, everything that I have told you is true and accurate. You negotiate the reps and warranties significantly. In the purchase agreement with Jeter, the reps and warranties were negotiated like you can't believe. And when people really wanna buy something, they don't focus on it because they just tell their lawyers to shut up because lawyers are saying to the client, they're saying, hey, this is a very broad rep and warranty. If this, if you've done something that you're not even aware of, you're gonna get in trouble. You could lose money out of your escrow account. There could be a lawsuit. There could be all sorts of things. And then clients say, you're just full of doom and gloom. I'm just signing it. Let's give the rep, let's give the warranty. I promise that a good client is reading those reps and warranties and is negotiating those very, very hard. A smart client is negotiating those reps and warranties very, very hard. Daniel Snyder may be a lot of things, but a dummy he's not. When he has a signed agreement to buy the shares for however much money he bought them for, 800 million, let's say, he is not gonna sign a document that says the numbers you've been given, because that's part of what you are representing to a buyer, is that the financials, the due diligence, the financial statements for your company, those are accurate. I stand behind them. I personally had to sign the, the audit of every 18 years of audits. The Marlins got audited every year, just like every baseball team, by professional auditors, big three. It used to be Ernst & Young or PricewaterhouseCoopers. You are, you are audited by several different accounting firms because MLB gets your financials. So that's why I've told you Rob Manford and everyone at MLB knows exactly what every team's payroll is and what it's going to be. They know exactly which players are going to be traded. So don't let them say they don't. But, and the union does too, by the way. So the union and, and, Major League Baseball, they see your financials and it's an audit and you have to sign this audit. You have to represent as president of the team that everything contained herein is true to the best of your knowledge. And if it's not true and you should have known, then you're going to get in trouble, which is why I would meet with our CFO every day. Because whatever was going on was going to be my responsibility. So I sure as hell better know what's going on. So not for one minute do I believe that Daniel Snyder would have misrepresented to his partners what was going on. I don't believe he would have misrepresented his financials to the league. I don't believe he would have misrepresented to his auditors. Wait a minute. People have done that. People have made up things in order to look better. <gasps> Guess what, Danny? You're at 14 minutes and counting. I'm going to give you a Friday wait to see. Roger Goodell's had enough. The other owners have had enough. You are nothing but a pain in their neck and you have been for a decade and now the juice is not worth the squeeze. Daniel Snyder will be forced and will sell the Washington Commanders prior to 2024. He's gonna have another year, maybe another two as part of an agreement, but Daniel Snyder's done. So for all you fans of the Red Anders, Celebrate the fact that this tenure is coming to an end, but be careful what you wish for, because sometimes the devil you know. We come back, we're gonna review a TV series that really got to me, 
And then we're going to talk about why Mets and the Mets fans, they may actually be cursed. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you for making it through that gauntlet of commercials. By the way, if the volume on the commercials is too high, just turn the volume down when the commercials come on and then turn it back up when my voice comes back on. I have no idea why that's the case. Several of you have reached out to me. I forward your request or your query to Coca, who responds with the FU emoji. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with that other than say, looks like Coca's grumpy again. So I came up with a possible solution. Just touch the volume button. Touch me, babe. Okay. I watched a series I had it suggested to me called Casual. It is produced by Jason Reitman. And it was four seasons, 44 episodes, 10, 13, 13, and then eight. Four seasons. And it ended last night. It, it ended in 2018, I think. But my binge ended. And I am having a tough day today. Because... Binging is like when you're reading a great book and you can't put it down, but when you're forced to put it down because you have to go to bed, but you want to say one more chapter, you put the bookmark at the end of the next chapter and say, let me just get to the bookmark. And then reluctantly you put it down, but you can't wait to bring it back up. But then you've got to go to work, but then you bring the book to work. You may read it on your commute if you don't drive. Then you say it could be an audio book. And then you get home, you do it first thing, so you don't do the laundry, all the different things. That's what binging is. You can't stop. And I'm now going through what last happened to me with a show called Love and then a show called Breaking Bad, a show called Friends from College. I can't even think of all the shows because when you binge a show that has ended and you love it, at the end, the credits roll and you'll never be in that setting again. You'll never be with that family again. The reason why I'm going to ask you to feel that way with casual, if you've ever had issues with your parents, if you've ever had divorce in your family, if you've ever been a teenager who had angst and was trying to figure out your path, if you've ever had issues in the dating world or marital issues or tried to understand what your intentions were, or what your feelings were, if you ever like to laugh and to cry and to look in the mirror and say, wow, I'm not alone, then this series is for you. It's called Casual. Please enjoy it. All right, as far as the Mets are concerned, I really do apologize for what's happening right now. And I understand the way you all feel, so much so that someone sent a question to me that we're gonna answer. You know what I want? I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. That's when you get into my Twitter. Please follow me at David P. Samson. We have fun on that platform. And you get into the DMs, and I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can. I engage with so many of you. I hope you realize that. Obviously, I can't engage with all of you, given the numbers. There, it's literally physically impossible for me to engage with everyone who DMs me. But thank you. And so, so you want to text Samson comes from a movie called Half Baked for all the new listeners. And I just got word that there were so many of you during March. So welcome. We keep going. We're here every day, just not Saturday and Sunday, because sometimes I need to rest my vocal cords. So there's a movie called Half Baked. Half Baked has a character named Samson, and everyone wants to talk to Samson. So if you've never seen Half Baked, my suggestion to you is this weekend. Smoke a fatty and watch Half Baked. Here's the question. At what point do the Mets say that DeGrom is so injury prone that an extension is not worth it? And what about his comments that he is certainly opting out? I chose this question because of the news that came out yesterday, so I had to talk about it anyway. I would have preferred you to say hello, David. By the way, if you spell my name wrong, your question will not make the air. The P stands for Philip, David P. Sampson. No P in Sampson. The P is Philip. But I understand the confusion because Twitter's at David P. Sampson. So for whatever reason, people sort of move the P four spaces to the right. I'm not sure I understand why, but they do. So yesterday, 
Just a little comment came out from Buck Showalter, definitely not from Sandy Alderson, definitely not from Billy Epler. Came out from their new spokesman, Buck Showalter. Everyone's so excited that he's the manager of the Mets. They've got a winner. They've got someone who's serious, who knows baseball. He's been around. He's a lifer. He's going to bring renewed optimism. He's going to bring a level of knowledge to the Mets. He's going to be the one who brings Steve Cohn the World Series that he promised you in the next two to four years. Buck Showalter, everyone's been excited. They've been piggybacking. They had DeGrom throw three innings, then Scherzer throw six innings. They signed Scherzer. They're paying him more than the payroll of the Pirates and the Orioles and the Guardians. Scherzer comes in as this sort of person with his World Series title in 2019 as someone who's supposed to lead the Mets with DeGrom to form the greatest one-two punch ever. And that, who's going to want to play them in a short series? Nobody. Who's going to want to play them in a long series? Nobody. But you got to get to the playoffs. The Mets still have Pete Alonso. Got great bats. Robinson Cano's back. Buck Showalter says yesterday, Jacob DeGrom came in today with a sore shoulder. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. That was all he said. He's supposed to start. He has his next spring training start, I think it's tomorrow. He's going to go get an MRI today. And people in Metsville are panicked, as they should be. Jacob DeGrom is one of the best pitchers who I've seen. But is he very different than Josh Johnson, the great Marlins pitcher whose career was derailed by injuries? Now, people are going to say, you're delusional, David. Jacob deGrom has a Cy Young Award. Jacob deGrom is the single ace in all of baseball. True, Josh Johnson doesn't have a Cy Young Award. Josh Johnson had one of the heaviest fastballs, greatest sinkers. If you haven't watched him pitch, you're missing something. This big, strong guy. One of the hardest things in baseball is to be a pitcher who pitches for 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, to start 30 games a year. It's why the success and the health of Justin Verlander is just inspiring. Yes, he ended up with Tommy John, but Justin Verlander is, you know, a horse is what they call it. So DeGrom has his two Cy Young Awards, but he's not a Hall of Famer. He hasn't won anything, and he doesn't have enough career bulk because he's always hurt. Whether it's his shoulder, his elbow, his knees, his toes, his head, doesn't matter, something comes up. And at some point, presidents and GMs say, Ganug, we can't rely on this player. But the reason why the Mets haven't done that with DeGrom is the better the player the longer it takes for someone to say, it's not going to work out. We can't count on you. Jacob DeGrom is 34 years old, and his talent so far outweighs any injury history because even if you get him to start 10 games, you feel like you're going to win those 10 games. So that's better than any fifth starter would be or any 12th starter. So you just pitch him till his arm falls off or his elbow, or his knees, or his toes. But what about the money side? This is where being Steve Cohn and the Mets gives everyone such an advantage, which is why Mets fans should not feel cursed. They should feel nothing other than fortunate. Because there aren't many teams, and there aren't many owners, who would continue to invest in a pitcher where you're getting, what's his rate, Coco? What do you think? I'm going to say he's getting paid this year, 26. Is that possible? There's a website I'm sure you can go to. Whatever his money is, and he can opt out at the end of this year. 36. Holy crikey, I was off by 10. $36 million if you start 33 games. It's over a million dollars to start. I don't want to get into the math because I have about the number of fans that have to be in your stadium, the number of incremental fans that have to make it worth it to give a pitcher a million dollars for a start. The math, it doesn't work. The money you can get paid back is if you make the playoffs, World Series, etc. The Mets certainly have increased excitement around them. They're announcing like every other team that they've got increased season ticket holders. They've got increased awareness. They love where they stand from a revenue standpoint. 
Jacob DeGrom, before the season started, already said he was opting out of his contract. He's due to make $30 million next year, and he's already telling you he's going to opt out, which is absolute horse hockey. Of course he's not going to opt out if he has another injury plague season. If he misses the first month of the season, you think he's still opting out? Come on. That was rhetorical. What's the answer? This is when, again, I wish we had a studio audience, Coca. Or, or like we could call on people, like in a, in a classroom. Yes. What, what's your answer? Yes, hanger on the couch that used to have this shirt that I'm wearing. What's the answer? Ah, if he gets an, a bigger offer from another team for more than the $30 million, bingo. Is there another team who will take Jacob DeGrom and say, no, he's not going to be hurt next year. Finally, it'll be the time when he's healthy, even though he's going to be turning 35 next season. So my advice to you, Mets fans, is this. An extension for Jacob DeGrom is 100% not worth it because at 35 years old, there are very, very few pitchers who are successful after age 35, and those pitchers are only ones who really have no major significant injury past. Jacob DeGrom is not getting any younger, and he's not getting any less injury prone. So you have to be willing to let him go. If you really want to win a World Series, and after, ne after this season when the Mets don't win, it'll be down to one to three years. It started at three to five. Now it's two to four. It's going to become one to three. His comments about opting out, they're meaningless. Thanks for the question. By the way, it could be nothing. They could get the MRI and say it's clean. They're going to tell you that anyway. Totally clean. We're just going to rest him. We're going to have him miss a start, but then he'll start again the next day. But it's not going to change the narrative about Jacob deGrom. He is injury prone, and that doesn't go away. Here's what else doesn't go away. Teams with James Harden can't win the title. Sorry. I was wrong yesterday. I thought the Sixers realized that getting the number one seed would be fun. It'd be good to say they won the East. They're going into Detroit, and guess what? Not only did they not cover the 11-point spread, they lost the freaking game. 37 and 28. That was a terrible loss, but I'm doubling down. We're taking the Thunder plus four at home versus the Pistons. Thunder plus four at home versus the Pistons. Are the Pistons, who've lost over 50 games, are they going to win two straight? I think not. That's my Friday pick. What are you doing Saturday? Part of the excitement on the HBO show tonight is the conversation between Bomani and the rest of us about Duke and North Carolina and his thoughts about Mike Krzyzewski and the Duke program and Duke fans, etc. Duke, North Carolina, everyone's excited. If you're a Duke alum, this is your, this is it, right? You, you need to win this game. This is Coach K's last season. Duke, North Carolina is a great rivalry. It's probably a top 10 rivalry in sports. At me. You think it's the number one rivalry? No. Top 10. Not in the world, like in the U.S., so Duke is favored by four points over North Carolina. How many of you believe in the fairy tale? I do. I believe it. I believe that there's something magical that happens. The magic has been Duke is in the final four. That's it. North Carolina, if you watch that team and how well they're coached by Hubert Davis, the former Nick, they're no schleppers. Now, I grant you that Duke is playing on emotion. I grant you they've got some good players. But North Carolina was not an actual number eight seed. They shouldn't have been a number eight seed. It is going to be an exciting game that I assume everyone's going to watch. It's going to be a close game, and I'm taking North Carolina plus four. But the question I was thinking about with this game is if Duke wins the game, does that mean by definition Kansas or Villanova is going to win the title, because Duke will think to themselves, that's it. We went as far as we can go, and we won the big one. We'll always be known as having beaten North Carolina in the last year of Coach K's career in the Final Four. What more could we ask for? People thought when the Yankees beat the Red Sox in 03 on Aaron Boone's walk-off that that's it. Everything's great. They don't need to win the World Series against the Marlins. Guess what? 
are you still happy that the Yankees beat the Red Sox in the LCS but then lost the World Series? What's the use of that? It's about winning it all, not making the Final Four. It's not about making it to the championship game. It's not about making it to the World Series or the Super Bowl. Who remembers losers? We have a hard enough time remembering winners. If Duke beats North Carolina on Saturday and loses to Kansas or Villanova on Monday, Coach K's last and season was successful, but it wasn't the ultimate fairy tale send-off. The ultimate fairy tale is winning it. That's what people should be concerned about. But I worry that Duke views this game as the championship. And when you put that type of pressure on yourself in a Final Four game, the only beneficiaries are both the team you're playing in the Final Four, that particular game, which is UNC, and also the team that you're playing in the championship on Monday. I'm still taking North Carolina plus four. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the Final Four. No Grand Prix this weekend, so we can't watch that. I appreciate everything that we've been through this month, and we're starting again now. It's just business. Have a great weekend. This is nothing personal.